So welcome to lecture 4 of CS7015, the course on deep learning. Uh, today we will talk about uh, feed forward neural networks and back propagation. So a quick uh, recap of the story so far, right? So we started with MP neurons. Uh, we saw there were some problems with MP neurons. They could handle only Boolean inputs and Boolean outputs and the threshold needed to be hard coded. So from there we moved on to perceptrons which allowed for real inputs, real outputs and uh, sorry real inputs and uh, binary outputs and uh, we also learned an algorithm for uh, learning these weights and parameters right so we no need uh, there was no need to hand code these parameters anymore but then we found that for a single perceptron there's a limitation it cannot it can only deal with uh, functions which are linearly separable so then we went on to a multi-layered network of perceptrons and we proved by illustration that it can handle any arbitrary boolean function uh, whether linearly separable or not, the catch is that you will need a large number of neurons in the hidden layer, right? Uh, then we also observed that perceptrons have this harsh thresholding logic, so which makes the decisions very unnatural. It's 0.49, it's negative, 0.51 is positive. So we wanted something more smooth. So the smoothest approximation to the step function, which is the perceptron function, was the sigmoid function. Uh, Sigmoid is a family of functions and we saw one such function which was logistic function. And then we saw that it's very smooth now, it's continuous and differentiable. Now for the sigmoid neuron, a single sigmoid neuron, we saw a learning algorithm which was gradient descent. And we proved principally that it will always go in the direction where the loss decreases, right? So that was the basis for gradient descent. And then we graduated from a single neuron to a network of neurons and made a case that such a network of neurons with enough neurons in the hidden layer can approximate any arbitrary function, right? Okay, so I have told you that it can approximate any arbitrary function. What does that mean? And what is the, uh, what is the thing in the network that does all this? All the, the tower functions and the tower functions depend on weights and biases. So there in that illustrative proof, again, we were adjusting the weights and biases by hand, right? We knew that we wanted these very tiny tower functions and we were doing it. Now from there, where should we go? We need an algorithm to learn these weights and biases, right? So that's what back propagation is. So today I'm going to formalize these feed forward neural networks. We just did it by illustration the other day. Now I'll introduce you to the terminology and see what the input outputs are and so on. And then uh, we'll look at the alg an algorithm for learning the weights in this feed forward neural network, okay? So, okay, let's begin. So this, a lot of this material is inspired by the uh, video lectures by Hugo Larochelle on uh, back propagation. He has a course on neural networks. Uh, it's available on uh, YouTube, you can check it. Okay, so let's first begin by introducing feed forward neural networks, right? So what is a feed forward neural network? The input to the network is an n-dimensional vector, okay? So that means my input belongs to Rn, that's fine. The network contains L minus one hidden layers, right? We already know what hidden layers are, right? We have been defining that terminology since a uh, multi-layered perceptron. So you have these hidden layers and there are L minus one of these. And then it has one output layer containing K neurons, okay? This is what a feed forward neural network looks like. What is missing here? The weights, right? So each neuron in the hidden layer, okay, before that, each neuron in the hidden layer and the output layer can be split into two parts, right? So I'll call the first part as the pre-activation and the second part as the activation. Have you seen this split before? Right? What does the pre-activation do? Aggregation. Aggregation. And what does the activation do? non-linearity, right? So we have this pre-activation and activation at every layer. And AI and HI are vectors. Is that correct? Because this entire thing, or rather this part is H1 and this part is A1. Both of these are vectors, right? And for this discussion, I'm going to assume that everything till here belongs to Rn, okay? So the input was Rn. And all the hidden layers also have n neurons. Is that fine? So please pay a lot of attention to this couple of slides because this is going to stay with us for the rest of the lecture. 
and perhaps two more lectures and even for the course, right? So this is very important that you understand this, the way we are defining a feed forward neural network, okay? Uh, the input layer can be called the zeroth layer. What I mean by that is that I could refer to this as H0, okay? There is no A0, H0 here because there's no pre-activation activation. You're just given the input. So I'll just call it as H0, okay? And the last layer can be called as H of L, right? Whatever you get from this green part, you'll call it as H of L, okay? What's the dimension of H of L? R raised to K, right? It belongs to RK because I have said here that you have K neurons, each corresponding to K classes, okay? Now, we have weights between the input layer and the first hidden layer. Now, can you tell me this belongs to Rn? This also belongs to Rn. So, what's the dimension of W1? N cross N, right? Because it contains weights for connecting each of these inputs to each of these hidden layers. There are N here, N there, right? So, it's N cross N. And what are the dimensions of the bias? N, one corresponding to each of the hidden inputs, fine? And this is only for up to this layer because still here I have assumed everything is N. Now, what about the output layer? N cross K and the bias is K, K dimensional, okay? So, this is what the network looks like, but now I have to give you some functions, right? I have just, I have shown you a diagram, but what does it mean mathematically? Because remember that we are always interested in writing something of the form Y is equal to function of X, right? And that is not well defined yet, okay? So, let's start defining that. Ignore the red portion for now, okay? I'll go over it. So, each of these activations, right, or rather the pre-activations is given by BI plus WI into HI minus 1. So, what it means is that these activations take inputs from the previous layer, multiply them by the weights, and also add the bias. Is that clear? So, let's see it, right? For example, if I look at A1, which is this vector. So, that's three-dimensional, and I'm assuming it's three-dimensional for simplicity. So, it's A11, A11, A12, A13, right? And that is equal to, uh, how do I get rid of this? <laughs> okay. Uh, B11, B12, B13 plus this matrix multiplication. Is this clear to everyone? Okay. I know it's trivial, but I'm still going over it, right? So, let's not, okay. And then how do you do this matrix multiplication? R row was multiplied by the column, right? So, this is what you'll get, right? And in the end, I can write it as this, right? And this looks very similar to what we have been seeing throughout, right? From uh, MP neuron to perceptron to sigmoid neuron and now this case, right? So, it's just an aggregation of all your inputs, a weighted aggregation of all your inputs. That's the case which I wanted to make, right? And that's obvious now. So, you understand what these are, right? So, this is Rn. In our case, we have assumed n equal to 3. What is this? I'll keep asking till this is completely fine with everyone. Rn and this is n cross n and this is n cross 1, r cross n, I mean Rn, sorry. Is it fine? So, everyone understands the operation happening here. It's a weighted aggregation of your inputs. So, every guy here is a weighted aggregation of all the inputs, okay? Now, after that, I do Hi of x is some function of ai of x, okay? What does this mean? So, this is again a vector, right? I have assumed that it's three-dimensional. So, these are the three elements of hi. So, these are the three guys. Now, these are some function of these light blue guys, okay? Now, how does that function operate on the vector? It operates element-wise. Not all functions on vectors are element-wise, but this particular function we are going to do element-wise. That means that H11 is equal to G of A11, H12 is equal to G of A2, and H13 is equal to G of A13, right? Where, if I take G of A13, one of the functions that I could choose is the sigmoid function. So, it would just be 1 over 1 plus E raised to minus A13, right? So, what is happening is I am taking this value and passing it through the sigmoid function to get, oh, sorry, I am taking this value and passing it through the sigmoid function to get H11, taking this value, passing it through the sigmoid function to get H12, right? So, the key thing to understand here that this is a element wise operation, right? It's not operating on the vector. That doesn't make sense. It's operating on every element of the vector, right? Okay. 
and G is called the activation function. It could be logistic, tan H, linear, anything, right? So we will see some of these functions later on. Okay. Now, the activation at layer I, uh, sorry, this is supposed to be activation at the output layer. The activation at the output layer is given by the final function, right? Which is f of x is equal to uh, o of a of. So let's see. So this is a3. In our case. L was equal to 3 because we had L minus 1 hidden layers and the Lth layer was the output layer, right? So this is A L. So this is what I have computed here, the light green uh, part of the figure that you see, right? Now based on that, I want to produce an output, right? So that day someone had asked me a question that why do we always choose sigmoid? Because sigmoid will clamp the output to 0 to 1. What if I want to predict the amount of oil which will not be between 0 to 1, right? That's why for the output, we'll use a spatial function that we'll call the output function. And later on, I'll show you that it depends on the task at hand. Okay, so it's going to change with the task that we're going to do, right? So we are just going to say that the final output, which is H of L, is equal to some function of the pre-activation at that layer. Is this terminology clear to everyone? How is each function operating? Is that clear to everyone? Okay, and we'll see some examples of the output activation function. Right. Now, just for simplicity, I'm going to remove the x's from the bucket, right? So instead of calling everything ai of x, hi minus of x and so on, I'll just call them ai, hi and so on, right? So that just simplifies things. But we know that everything is a function of x because x is the input and that passes through some functions and we get the final output, okay? Fine. So this is the notations that we're going to use. Is the dimension of everything that you see here, every variable that you see here completely clear to everyone? Dimension of ai, bi, w, hi, x, everything is clear, okay? And the output layer has a slightly different dimension than the other layers because there we have k classes as opposed to n neurons everywhere else, okay? Fine. Now, I need to put this in the paradigm that we saw for supervised machine learning. What were the five components there? Data, model, parameters, learning algorithm, objective function, right? Okay, everyone remembers that? Okay, so I said that we'll do deep neural networks and we are trying to write this y hat as a function of x. But then what I gave you is just a diagram from which this is not clear whether y hat is actually a function of x. How many of you think y hat is actually a function of x? Very few, okay? So let's see what exactly is our model assumption here, right? So the question, let me repeat the question just to be clear. So I had said that we are given some data. We don't know the true relation between y and x. We make an assumption that y is related to x using some function f, right? And it is, has some parameters. And then we like to try, try to learn the parameters of that function. So what is the function here? So what is your model? What have you assumed as the model? Can you write y as a function of x? If yes, what is that function? How many of you have the answer or think you have the answer? Okay, I think I can't wait more. So I'll give you the answer, then it will become very obvious. Okay, so this is how y is a function of x, right? So let's see what is happening. I took the original x, which was this. I transformed it, added b1. That was the dash at layer 1. No, no, this thing pre-activation at layer 1. I passed it through the activation function, right? Okay, now again, let's be clear about the dimensions. What's the dimension of this? N. What's the dimension of this? N cross N. So what's the dimension of this product? N. What about this? So what's the product, the final dimension of this? Rn. Now you're passing it through a function g. That function is operating element wise. So what's the output dimension? Rn. Rn. So this is again Rn. Okay, now this. So now you see the whole story, right? So now this n cross n guy multiplies with this n guy. Again, you get a vector. Again, pass it through a nonlinearity. Was it so hard? It's obvious now, right? You just take an x, just note down all the transformations that you have done. That's what a function does, right? It passes it through the 
uh, through first a linear transformation, this is a linear transformation, then a non-linear transformation, then again linear, non-linear and so on, right. So just see how far we have come from where we started off, right. We started off with simple things like W transpose X, right, that was the perceptron model where we were taking decisions based on W transpose X and we were saying Y is equal to 1 if this quantity is greater than something, Y is equal to 0 if this quantity is greater than something, right. That's where we started off with. We made it slightly more complicated by doing this. This was sigmoid neuron. Now from where, there, where have we gone? To this, right. So we have increased the complexity of the network. With great complexi complexity comes great no power, <laughs> right. We have already seen the representation power of deep neural networks, right. So it comes from this complexity that you have. You have a lot of linear and non-linear transformations, right, that adds to the complexity of the network. It has more parameters at each linear transformation you have some parameters and you are also using a lot of non-linearity. So, so that is the reason why deep neural networks are so powerful, right. Do you get that? Okay, fine. So just to impress again, right. So any machine learning algorithm that you have, you should be able to write it in this form, right, that y is a function of x with some parameters and then your job boils down to learning these parameters, right. It just happens that here y is a very complex function of the inputs. Is that clear? Okay. So I am not deviated from the original story. I am still being able to write y as a function of the x with some parameters. Okay. So what are the parameters? All the w's, all the b's, right. So W1 to WL and B1 to BL and the algorithm that we are going to see today for learning these parameters is called gradient descent but we will use it with back propagation where back propagation will help us to compute gradients. It is okay, it does not it doesn't make sense at this point that is what the lecture is supposed to be about, right. So and what is an objective function? Loss function. So I could just go with this loss function, right. Uh, there is an error here. I thought we corrected this. There is a summation. So actually these are vectors, right? So this does not make sense. So you should have summation j equal to 1 to k yij minus yij. Does that make sense? So this is the vector y hat, okay. For the ith example, it will be called as y hat hi i, which will have k elements, right? So y hat i1, y hat i2 up to y hat i k, right. So that is what my predictions are and I will have the corresponding true vector also. I am trying to take the difference between them which is going to be an element wise difference. Adrian Arendt understands the error in the slide. How many of you do not get it? How many of you get it? If you do not get it, please raise your hands. It is a minor thing, I can correct it, okay. So okay, is the paradigm clear now, okay, and why, how does deep neural networks fit into these, this paradigm, okay. <laughs>